Welcome to this time of contemplation and reflection for Good Friday. We begin by reading from the Gospel of St Mark some selected verses from chapter 15. Starting at verse 16 we read, The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is, the praetorium, and called together the whole company of the soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spat on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him out to crucify him. We move then to verse 25. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, He was counted with the lawless ones. Those who passed by hurled insults, insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who were going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. We will hear more from the word of God later on. But right now, we join in worship as we sing together. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to share with you, and I feel so privileged that I've been asked to lead you in prayers on this Good Friday morning. I hope you're all keeping well and safe. Uh, you've all been very much in my thoughts and prayers over these past few weeks, and that will continue over a period of time, obviously. I'd like, before I pray with you this morning, to bring you some words from Philippians, one of my favourite passages in the Bible. And I've chosen the message translation this morning. Don't fret or worry. 
Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the centre of your life. As Christians, we have that surety in prayer that worry can be displaced and replaced with that peace. Shall we pray together? Father, the reality of Good Friday and the suffering of your Son is the surety of everlasting life through our risen Lord. Today we contemplate on the great sacrifice of your Son, his anguish, pain and death. Yet, always in the forefront of our mind is that hope, joy, love and peace as we look to Easter Sunday. When we celebrate, rejoice and give thanks for the resur resurrection of our Saviour, who died that we might live. Father, we come to you in these surreal times and pray for that peace, your peace, which passes all understanding to guard our hearts and minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may have noticed that um, I've been playing music in the background um, during those prayer times. It's called Peace Like a River, one of my favourite songs to pieces, and it speaks of hope, love, strength, all the things that we need just now. I've recorded it for Nigel to play if there's time. And meanwhile, I would just say to you, lovely to talk to you. Keep safe, everyone, until we're able to meet again. It won't be long before we can be together with our families, our friends and our church fellowship. Can't wait. God bless you, everyone, and see you soon. Bye.
Mark chapter 15, verses 33 through to 39. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, and put it on the staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. There are so many songs that are helpful on a day like Good Friday. Maybe you have some favourites. One I remember learning at school asks the question, were you there where they crucified my Lord? I used to think, what a strange question. Of course I wasn't, it was around 2000 years ago. But maybe that song calls us to put ourselves in that place, to try and be present at that place, at that time, to that event that changed the world forever. Imagine if we were there, we stand, we stand still, rooted to the spot. We don't want to watch, but we have to. We gaze at Jesus on the cross. Our hearts break for the pain that he suffers, for the desolation he faces, for the sheer injustice of it all. We look around. We see his closest friends with confusion and sorrow in their eyes. We catch a glimpse of his mother we see her tears as she hunches over. Our hearts are heavy, our eyes are full. And yet, as we stand watching this seemingly desperate scene, we know that there is something amazing happening because we stand on this side of Easter. We know that although it looked so powerless, it was quite the opposite. There was great power in what Jesus did that day. We talk about it, we sing about the power of the cross, meaning, of course, the power of what Jesus accomplished by going to the cross. But what does that mean for us? What is the power of the cross for us? Let me read Colossians 2, verses 13 to 15. Paul is writing to the early church, trying to explain this very thing. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet put away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. These few verses capture the work of Christ on the cross. Look at me at with me. Verse 13 reminds us of our condition. It talks about us being dead in our sins. In other words, we were choosing to go our own way rather than God's way. We are following other things rather than following him. Without him, we were heading for death. And so we acknowledge our need of him. Paul then goes on to describe the power of the cross and references three aspects. Firstly, we are forgiven. Verse 14, he cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Let that sink in for a moment. All I've ever done wrong, all I will ever do wrong, all the times I've gone my own way, Jesus took it all for me in my place. He did what I could not do for myself. Because of him, I am forgiven. This, the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us, took the blame, bore the wrath, 
we stand forgiven at the cross. But that's not all. When we accept his forgiveness, for accept it we must, it's our choice to accept or reject this gift. What does Paul write? God made you alive with Christ. The death we deserved is no more. We have life because of Jesus and not just any kind of life. We have life in all its fullness, as John 10, 10 says. Life that brings freedom, life that will never end. Oh, to see my name written in the wounds. For through your suffering, I am free. Death is crushed to death. Life is mine to live, won through your selfless love. This, the power of the cross. And you know, often we stop there. We celebrate the fact that we have forgiveness and life because of Jesus' death and resurrection. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. These verses from Colossians tell us there's something more. Look at me with verse 15 of Colossians 2. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So what's that about? Tom Wright, in his For Everyone commentary, explains it by describing the culture of the time, the context of first century Palestine. To celebrate triumphs over hated enemies, a ruling power would do something to make maximum symbolic impact. This often took the form of bringing back what you might call the spoils of war. This would consist of all they had taken and captured from their enemy and often included a long and bedraggled line of prisoners. And if possible, at the end of the line, the king of the nation they defeated. And then, at the climax of the big celebration that they would have, the king would be ceremonially executed. This was what was happening more or less when the Romans crucified Jesus under the sign that read, King of the Jews. Even though Jesus wasn't seen as worth taking back to Rome, as he hadn't led a serious military revolt or anything, every crucifixion, even a strange one like that of Jesus, was another symbolic triumph for Rome. And therefore, anyone living at that time, watching Jesus' crucifixion, would think that the rulers and authorities were celebrating a public triumph over him. Now, with that in mind, Look again at what Paul wrote to the Colossians. On the cross, Jesus disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Rather than the authorities celebrating a triumph, it was God who was celebrating the victory. And not only over earthly authorities, but over the spiritual authorities, over death and sin. How fantastic is that? So the power of the cross... The power of what Jesus did on the cross is forgiveness and life and victory. That's the power of the cross. That's the significance of what Jesus did for us at Calvary. That's the power of Christ's love for us. So what's your response? What's my response? Are you reminded of your own sinfulness and your need of forgiveness? I'm sure I am. That's the first step. Have you accepted his forgiveness that he offers in love? Do you know what it's like to live that abundant life in Christ? Are you ready to follow Jesus and go his way? Or to continue to follow Jesus and go his way even more? For those of us who know his forgiveness and enjoy life with him, I guess the question is, how can we allow him to reign more freely in our lives. Maybe during this time when we have more time to reflect it's an opportunity to really nurture our relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a few moments to reflect as Jonathan Searle sings The Power of the Cross which was recorded at a Boscombe Easter convention a few years ago. And so just where you are allow God to speak to you and may you respond to his offer of forgiveness of life and a victory. This, the power of the cross, Son of God, slain for us, what a love, what a cost, we stand forgiven at the cross. 
Amen.
God, we thank you for being with us in this wondering moment where we stand poised between life and death, filled to the brim with sorrow, filled with thoughts of what has been and what lies before us. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for our friend Jesus, who is a gift to the world, a gift in each of our lives. Comfort us, even as we are shaken by the horror of these last hours. Be our friend in this time of sorrow and sustain us in the days to come. Now may God bless you and keep you. May the very face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God's presence embrace you and give you eternal peace. Amen.